creators, welcome back to the club. The Black Creators Club is the go-to resource for Black movers and shakers in Hollywood, reactions to the latest pop culture tea, and our own entertainment pursuits. Today, I am super, super excited that Ebony and I get to welcome this very special guest that you see on screen that you're about to hear in your ears. We're talking about the hip hop and R&B label relations, music mogul in the making, creator of Live the Biz and Music Mind and Motivation. Let's welcome Walter Tucker to our beautiful, beautiful semi-studio. <laughs> What's Thank up? You. That was an amazing <laughs> intro. Like you almost I liked it. <laughs> I feel like I pride myself on my intros. I feel like you kind of just, you know, <laughs> step it up. past me. Stop past Listen. me. <laughs> you come in, you're in the building people, <laughs> people know that you are here, okay? <laughs> That's well, thank it. you. I appreciate that being with my first fam sisters. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, I appreciate the love. You know, I love what y'all are doing. So I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. And I mean, today we got a packed, packed show for y'all. Like, as usual, we start with our Maven to Maven check-in, but we're going to switch it up. It's going to be Maven to Maven to music, mogul in the making check-in. And we'll just talk about our lives there. Um, before delving into just, you know, Walter's experience in the music business, for those who are aspiring to get into the business, in the business now, and it's a great person to at least know and um, keep on your radar. So we'll get more into towards like his, his old history before delving into some of the major topics of of music today, something that we want to talk more about, which is cancel culture and the reason why a lot of these music artists today are being canceled left, right, and center. So we're going to just talk about all of that. Um, and then we'll go into our game. We're playing a great game with them. And what's a better game to play these days and ages with music versus, you know, talking about the versus battle. Like we're going to talk about some of the things that we think, some of the artists that we think should be next up and who Walter would pick. And yeah. then finally, delve into his latest pursuits with music, mind, and motivation. And it's, it's just going to be so much, so much goodies, so many good things. But let's first start with our check-ins. Ebene, what's going on with you? Hey, guys. <clears throat> hey, hey, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just woke up, apparently. I don't know. I'm like, okay. Um, no, everything is good over here. Actually, I take that back. We had a whole, like, mini crisis in the apartment it, yesterday and Friday. The pipes are leaking in the kitchen. The bathroom's not working. The neighbors is backed up. Like, we're all just like a mess over here. <laughs> so, like, I have, we're not cooking. The microwave has shortaged. Like, it is just a mess. Well, is that just in your area or just happens to be in your home? This is what we're dealing with. No, it's in my house and <laughs> neighbor too. Like, it's a mess. So that happened. Um, and then I did a live interview on my Instagram this week with Jasmine Lawrence, who is the creator and co creative director at um, Her Distraction, which is like a clothing brand. And so that was really fun and it went really well. So you guys can check that out on my Instagram, okay? At Ebony Chapman 12. Shameless plug right there, okay? Plug it all in. Plug it all in. No shame. Have no shame in your plugs. Right. Um, but yeah, and then I ordered all of these like felt pens, you guys, I would go get them, but they're on my bed. I have like rainbows. I bought like 20 of these. It was like in a pack to help yeah. me keep more organized. I don't know if this is what I'm doing in quarantine. Just I, lo I love that. I love that. I love the stationary, stationary flex. <laughs> <laughs> that is so great. But Akila, what is going on with you, my maven? What is happening with you, girl? Listen, I mean, I think this was the week where I'm just happy to be a little more stable. I'm like, you know, week after week, you're working hard, you're doing other things, you're pursuing other stuff. And it's just like this week, I felt like kind of was a bit of a coasting week, which I appreciated the silence. I appreciated just getting caught up with shows. I've been watching 90 Days. I've been even catching up with Seinfeld. Seinfeld, which you know, is like pretty much a classic, but the classic depending on who you're talking to. And, and I didn't grow up on Seinfeld. So finally, it's like, let me see what this is all about. And I, I mean, I believe the hype. So, so it's been good doing that. You know, besides that, I'm with you on the whole, like creating different things. You know, I started a whole new series on my um, Instagram as well. And yes, we're trying to do a little thing when it comes to media, when it comes to TV and just, you know, always be creating. So, you know, it's been, it's been fun. It's been a good different thing to do. And then besides that girl, just, just hanging out. A, a friend from business school came to visit, um, Earlier this week and so just been catching up with that too and it's been it's been good nothing too crazy but you know we're happy we're happy for that <laughs> i don't want any problems so it's been good what about you walter what's going on with you 
everything just always always working <laughs> always working uh dealing with a few a few top level music projects right now um yeah and just really just trying to just maintain you know mental health self-care you know what i'm saying it's been a really rough year um not professionally freshly has been great i just just all around us right like our communities and what we're seeing on the news and with politics and with just like covid stuff so really just trying to like stay centered um because you know when you're doing work you have like this structure right of like you need to accomplish this thing and then that's it like that's what you're in line but outside of your work sometimes you don't have that mm-hmm. you don't have that structure of like a daily routine of things that you do so I've kind of just been working more as far as that as far as just balancing that 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 care and that self-care and that consciousness outside of work that is so true and that's so yeah. So I'm working on that. That is my big project. <laughs> yeah. That's an ever going, ongoing project that will continue to yeah. seed this just time period right now. It'll go on forever. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's get right into it then. Let's get right into the things that you say. You have the balance, you may be creating the balance, but people are even trying to get to where you are at this stage of the game now. Can you talk a little bit more about? Your passion for music, has this passion always been there? What made you decide to pursue music professionally? Yeah, I mean, I could talk all day about it, but I'll try to make this this short. Um, So I think for me, um, it was really just about uh, discovery and about being curious regarding like, you know, what what happens? Like I'm watching TV, I'm watching Michael Jackson, I'm watching him, you know, jump out of a rocket and turn into a car, a spaceship. What are the things behind that that are making this happen? And I think I always had that just curiosity for just like, you know, what's behind the screen, right? Like what's what's making these things happen? So funny enough, we'll get into it later, but um, Teddy Riley, um, Teddy Riley, for those that know, the major super producer, King of New Jack Swing. Um, he had, so I'm from the Virginia Beach area. Shout out to like, you know, Portsmouth. I was born and raised, you know, Chesapeake, VA, Hampton, you know what I'm saying? Bad News, Suffolk, all that. Shout out, 757, what's up? And, uh, <laughs> And so he had moved to the area around like, I want to say like 90, 91. Um, and so we'd never had a celebrity, a music celebrity before in our area. So when like a, like a, a nice car would drive by, it was like, oh, that's probably Teddy Riley or like, you know, like a Lamborghini or something to pop up. And I'm like in the first grade, like this is like 1991, so I'm like in the first grade. I'm like, what is this name I keep hearing? So at that same time, um, super huge Michael Jackson fan. And Michael Jackson was like a superhero. He was everything. And I remember um, picking up the Dangerous CD. Dangerous, I don't know if you remember the time, y'all a little bit younger. Remember the time, jam, in the closet, you know what I'm saying? So I remember just happened to read the back of the credits and I saw the name Teddy Riley. And I'm like, this can't be the same guy they're saying that's in our area and the same guy that's like doing this for Michael Jackson. Cause you know, when the celebrities back in those days, you're thinking Michael Jackson's writing, producing, recording, he's doing everything, you know what I'm saying? You don't even know about these other roles. And so, knowing that he was in our area and then seeing the on the credits made me curious like well what is like what's an executive producer like what is that what is a producer what's the engineer and and that wormhole led me to researching those things at that young of an age and reading everything reading the back of the album credits for everything like labels looking at tv watching bet i'm seeing like jive records slash sony slash rca i'm trying to figure out what does that mean yeah. Mace had a lyric that was like, ASCAP, where my check be? Problem with y'all, I said directly. I'm thinking ASCAP is a person, but ASCAP is like a music publishing company. So I, I like looking that up on AOL.com. So like that wormhole of it started my love for really investigating the music industry and learning about it. And then, um, at, so then fast forward, I'm making this, sh- about to end this, uh, fifth grade, 1995, um, I meet Missy Elliott. Because what? I had never met Teddy Riley, you know what I'm saying, when I was young. And so he was like the first person. And then years later, we hear, start hearing like somebody named Timlin in our area, somebody named Missy, somebody named Pharrell, Chad, like these people kept popping up. Um, and she, Missy actually signed um, one of my friends from church, her name was Nicole Ray. She had signed her to the record deal. And so now Missy was the person, but Missy was outside. You know what I'm saying? Like Missy was like finger waves, like she was out. Yep. So my bus, my bus would drive. So my bus would go by her mom's house to take us back to you know, back home. And and um, there were some weeks where we see like a big 
Hummer truck outside. We're like, who's Hummer truck? Who's Bumblebee Hummer truck is that? There was Missy Elliott's. So I rode, my, so I rode my bike. This and she wasn't even like a star. She was just writing and producing. She wasn't even on TV. Like the rain, none of that stuff that came out yet. So we go up to Missy and we're like, Missy, like me and my friends, we run up like, Missy, how are you? Where are you getting these Jeeps from? Where are you getting these, like these cars from? And she's like, yo, I write and produce. Mm-hmm. I own my publishing. I'm writing for this um, new artist named Aaliyah. Um, I'm, I'm going to New York to meet with Diddy. Um, I'm going to take a flight to LA. And we're like, oh my God, like you're going to New York. You're going to LA. Like, she was like, yeah, like you guys are working in the industry too. Just stay in school and, you know, own your, own your, own your creativity and own your, you know, own your ownership and, and know about the business and stay creative. Um, but know that you can do it. Like I'm from this area, like I'm just born and raised here and I can do it. And so that, that pushed my love for, the music industry and, and the music business, just from the people in my area that inspired me and seeing what they were able to do, I knew that I could do those things too. And I ended up living in New York. I ended up working in London, living in London. I'm now in LA. So um, that representation really was beneficial for me and everybody in my area. I love, I love that that's how it happened because oftentimes, yeah. you know, we hear the saying, you can't be what you can't see. Right. And the fact that folks, actually that were from there showed back up and and at least popped in. You don't have to live there long term, but yeah. at least pop in and show folks that hey, I'm around and I'm making it. <laughs> it happens. I end up interning for Pharrell and Chad in college. You know what I'm saying? The Neptune. So it's like all those pieces was like that is so important to see that and have people really give you that. Because when I was growing up, and I'm sure you guys can relate too if you're not from those these cities, but New York and LA felt like that was it. Like yeah. if you weren't in New York or LA or weren't from there, you couldn't be a part of this business. That's what the advertisement was, <laughs> you know, maybe Atlanta at that time, um, but certainly wasn't as diverse as it is now. So I'm um, just seeing those black faces like myself, literally from my city, not just not from my state, like from my city, you know, like from my area, like seeing those things is really beneficial to me and wanting to learn more about it. Um, and so, yeah, that led me to again, going to college at John C. Smith University, um, HBC out in Charlotte majoring in music business, interning with like Star Trek and Warner Music, um, you know, going up to New York to live for the summer to intern at Sirius XM. Um, and then knowing that I went to, li- to move to New York after college. And then from there, interning, getting my MBA, working at different music companies and things of that nature, led me to that, that, that the industry, like that passion that was from the first grade, um, reading the back of album credits led me to, you know, 30 something years later, um, you know, being executive in the music industry. That's amazing. Love yeah. to see it, honestly. Like, yeah. you know, I I feel like when, when majority of the time when you do hear stories about like executive producers, Teddy Riley, um, like their backstory, it's so funny to me to hear they're like, yeah, and I was hanging out with Pharrell and we were in the studio and we right. were. <laughs> But right. at the time, it's like they're legit, not for real. Like how you think about them today, they're like a new artist coming in, like breaking into the industry. But like now, yeah. telling the story backwards, right? It's like it sounds like such a big deal. And all of these people kind of like grew up together in the industry. Yeah, they, they together. It's crazy to think they, like this is all your same generation, all going up and working with the same people, and it's low key kind of like a small business. It yeah. is. It, it's literally like that connective thread. Like people may not know, but for so Timbaland, Pharrell, Chad, um, and Shay from NARD were in a group called Surrounded by Idiots. They're called SBI in Virginia. So they went to, they were in a group together before Timbaland was even producing for Missy. Like they were in that. And then in that group is when the Neptunes were discovered by Teddy Riley at a talent show. You see what I'm saying? Like it's it's everything is just so interwoven and connected because then Timbaland was producing for Malice from the clips at the time. Pusha wasn't even rapping. Then when Timbaland went over with Missy and Malice and Pusha became a group, then they went with the Neptunes, you know, which got great Star Trek. So it's just, it's just, we're, I don't know. That's why I love my area so much. Shout out to 757 Virginia. Shout out, like, I love my whole state, but like, I got to rep my area. You feel me? Because there's just your area. It, there's so much creativity, literally, from these seven cities. Um, yeah. And they're really the fabric of, of who I am, you know? So that's amazing. Yeah, and I think that's what it also Issa Ray says this all the time. She was like, network across. Like, don't worry about networking up, like network across. Cause clearly all these people came up together. Facts. Um, and so this leads to the next question of just like, how does your work and career live up to your expectations, right? Like you have this great dream when you Good were question. younger, and now that you're actually doing what you said you want it to do, how has that 
um, let up or, you know, has it met your expectations? Has it been different than what you thought it was? <laughs> um, different. Yes. You know, <laughs> I, I, think, <laughs> I think everything is nuanced, right? Um, so yeah. So, you know, I work at, you know, major streaming company, um, you know, handling hip hop and R and B on several different projects. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's better than what I expected. And sometimes it's just very different. Like, um, on one part, you have the opportunity to help artists and to help projects and to be a voice of Black music, right? Which is super important because we talk about having gatekeepers and diversity in these spaces um, and to be able to have a role where I am helping, you know, people who look like us, you know, with their music and marketing. Those things are really empowering too. Um, and giving a platform to voices that need to be heard, right? From a um, talent level, from a content level, from creative, creative level. And that part is the rewarding part. That part is like the passion, you know what I'm saying? The purpose, right? <laughs> in doing that, sometimes you have to deal with other people in the entertainment industry who don't operate from that same purpose, that are maybe in it for different reasons, that are purely organic, purely transparent. So yeah. sometimes you have to get through those folks to get to people who you want to help. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that part isn't the pleasant part when you have to deal with people who have ulterior motives that aren't beneficial <laughs> to Black culture and Black art and the longevity in the careers of these artists. So you have that. Right. So that's, that's why there's the nuance there of make sure you're operating in your, your purpose, but sometimes that purpose has these different things you have to get through. And um, you don't necessarily see that when you're not in it, but when you're in it, you're like, oh man, like just to help that person, I got to talk to these four other folks. And the person I'm trying to help doesn't even realize the four other folks aren't in their best interest. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's, um, that's great. That's yeah. Great. And then, you know, those little things, if you have, you know, if you naturally like have integrity and, you know, are an honest person, you know, in the entertainment industry, that can be challenging because you have to, uh, <laughs> you're, you're saying what you mean and you're doing what you say you're going to do, but others aren't operating from that place. So you have to also deal with that as well. I hear that. How, how do you do that though? Because I feel like a lot of people <laughs> understand that it's happened. People even chuck it up to, oh, this is the business. You know, people even embody that role oftentimes because they recognize they can hide behind the phrase of it's just the business. How do you knowing that and knowing that, you know, your end goal remains your end goal, your North Star is still your North Star. Yeah. People, some of the tools, tell them how, how they in their position can also probably do you know what? That's a great question. It's really about um, knowing who you are, you know, knowing who you are, knowing that there's different sides of who you are. Um, I think what, what, what happens sometimes people get into this industry, not just music, acting, film, fashion, and they become whoever they think people want them to be um, or become whoever they, they didn't have the courage to be, which could be a good or bad thing. So I think it's really about knowing who you are. I think once you know that you're nuanced and that you have several layers um, and that you can be who you want to be and remind you of your, of your purpose. I think that'll help you navigate some of these uh, challenging and interesting personalities. Um, so that's it. That's a constant reminder. It's not something that you just set on and then you, it's just cruise control. It's really like a daily reminder, knowing the things that you can control and embodying the things that you can control um, and not stressing over the things that you cannot. You cannot change people. You cannot make people like you. Everybody doesn't need to be like you. Understanding that the morals or principles that you abide by doesn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so people are operating from hurt. People are operating from fear. People are operating from evilness. So people are operating from greed. Um, so just knowing what what you are and it's your sense, your, your sense and your, your worth um, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, is important and then surrounding yourself with people who you can talk to people who you can have allies for um and knowing who's your ally yeah everybody ain't, everybody ain't your ally um a lot of relationships are very transactional so understanding that too because there's a place for that too there's a place for every type of relationship um that you want everybody ain't your homie mm -hmm. everybody sometimes your homie now because they think you can do something for them um yeah. you know some people are your 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 ace boon coon now in mm -hmm. you know october some folks won't be around in November, you know, and some person that you thought you may have wrote off could end up being a lifelong, a lifelong mentor, or a lifelong mentee. So understanding where people operate and accepting it for that. Um, and then just know who you are. Once you know who you are, you know how to censor and balance all these different kind of relationships. Yeah. yeah. And I think that all takes so much time, right? To like really yeah. figure out who you are and balance that with outside opinions and whatnot. Um, but yeah. how do you think that the 
music industry has changed over the years, right? So like for me, I've noticed that I, this is my mind now. I'm not in the music industry, so I don't know. But in my mind, this is how I felt like it works. I've seen like I watched enough movies, right? To like figure it out. The Jackson um, dissertation. Behind the music. Right. Making, it, make, making the band five, I feel you. Right. Making the band five. I'm over here watching Dream Girls. Okay. Then, hey. okay. So um, I feel like back in the day, the record label really had a lot of say when it came to artists and the music that they put out the music that they sang wrote produced whatever like they and the singles that were released right and now since we have such a more um accessible world right so yeah. i feel like artists now kind of do a thing where they just put out an entire project right like beyonce kind of started like had started the trend of like i'm gonna drop a whole project and i'm gonna let y'all decide what my single is i'm not gonna tell you right. what my single is going to be, I'm going to let y'all decide. And then it ends up being because it's a story, right? The way, Mm -hmm. even like with Big Sean, right? It's a story, the way you write your music now that people are interested in the entire album. It's not just one song. How do you feel or think about that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's all about, you know, the art that the artist wants to present. You know, I think there's different spaces for different things. I think, you know, we talk about somebody like Beyonce, she's done the, here's the first single, here's the second single, here's the album. Like she's done all those things. And so, you know, in her you know, fifth, sixth album, yeah, you can experiment more, especially when you have such a, a massive fan base. Um, then yeah, you can do things like that. I don't think that's for every artist. <laughs> I think some artists kind of need to work up to it. I think sometimes artists that may do that, they may be trying to compensate for um, a smaller marketing budget uh, than what somebody like Beyonce would have. Because if she drops it, just out of nowhere, there's 80 videos. There's an HBO tie-in. There's, you know what I'm saying? So it's a little bit different. She'll just drop out of the sky. It's, you know what I mean? It's like she got 80 videos lined up in a whole, you know, Tim Burton movie on deck. <laughs> um, so people people got to be careful. Be easy. You know what I'm saying? Everybody can't lift up 500 pounds. You know what I'm saying? You got to know your weight, you know? Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think I think people got to do whatever works for them. And I think, yeah, I think now there's more freedom because you're digitally releasing things. So back in the day, it was all physical. And you had to kind of align up your marketing strategies with the CDs, the tapes that, you know, vinyl that was in stores. So you had to operate from the store perspective and kind of, you know, work your way, work your way up, work your way back. Now with digital distribution, you can kind of do whatever you want. It's just about knowing your audience and knowing how to reach them and having the marketing timeline, the marketing strategies together to make sure that the people who need to hear it, need to hear it. But still, yeah, there's definitely way more freedom with digital and stuff like that, um, just because of how people receive music. Is different yeah and how do, you, how do you expect or what role do you expect to play in the music industry going forward you know oh man or it's not as you want. <laughs> <laughs> are happening considering all the things are maybe the same and things are being accelerated what does walter want to do and what does walter want to be in this in this industry and how do you yeah. want to recognize you sure well i always have like a four or five year plan um so far, so good, you know? <laughs> so far, so good. Like you want a fast track here. <laughs> yeah, so far, so good. Yeah, in terms of the plan, like, I, you know, you add things, you adjust things, you have to transition, right? Um, I didn't imagine I'd be in LA. Um, what I'm doing in LA, I did imagine. So, um, yeah, I would say my goal, um, you know, the music industry changes so much and the roles and titles, words change so much. Um, so for me, it's always operating from the space of, being able to provide a platform for uh, creative black voices, um, specifically in music. So not to be too vague, but whatever role that takes is whatever role I want to be. Um, I want to be head of that. I want to be the global head of that. Um, but as long as the, the role is helping to uplift and amplify black creative voices in the music industry. Um, on the biggest platform possible. Um, and so that's essentially what I'm doing now is essentially what I want to continue to do, um, you know, on every level, um, not just in the US, but globally too. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, stepping out and listening to music, um, you know, Afro swing and Afro beats and grime and, you know, black artists in South Africa, um, like Casper, like Nadia Nakai, like, you know, YC in, in Nigeria and Ghana, like, you know, Grime, UK, I lived in the UK for a while. So, you know, with gigs and with Stefan Don, this Banks, with Lady Leisure, with Little Sims, like, you know what I mean? Like Sexy Boys, like, AST out in Berlin. Like, so 
you know, I want to help with five voices, not just in the U.S., but also being educated, knowledgeable of Black artists around the world um, and bridging the gap together between different voices, not just in hip hop and R&B, but in all areas of Black music. So whatever that role is and whatever that company is, whatever that is, that's what I want to do and be a bigger voice in that 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. No. Yes. And you can be that company, right? Like you don't need to work or find that job. You can create it, right? Um, Absolutely. Speaking of amplifying Black voices, that's exactly what we do here on the Black Creators Pub. We yes. are here to give everyone a choice and a and, and platform to come and talk to us about their projects and things that are going on. And we could not do that without you listeners out there. You guys are watching us and listening to us and supporting us. Continue to download our podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, as well as watch us and give us a like or thumbs up and subscribe to us on YouTube. You can also follow us on Instagram at the Black Creators Club. Everything is at the Black Creators Club. So we appreciate you guys so much and continue. Guys, we're on episode eight. Hey. <laughs> episode 08 bitch you gotta you know what i'm saying oh, yes. Come on. That's, that's a layup that's a layup for y'all <laughs> perfect episode right now we have fam on the channel on the 08 episode what yeah we are really some old heads i'm sure they showed up in some pink and green <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm saying y'all y- y- come on how does two aka's not have pink and green on the 08 episode Hello, like, what we are messing up. We are <laughs> messing up. <laughs> okay, I gotta do something. Put like a pick a green heart on the and caption I, or something I, like that. No, I mean, <laughs> the story beforehand. We gonna have something. As long as it's just tea, but I don't know what y'all doing. But <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm on my tea game. Heavy tea game. You should have came with the black and gold. You playing? I know. I had my black on. You feel me? I, you know, if it was the 06 episode, I would have. <laughs> Dang, that is messing up. Great. But you know, <laughs> music is such a hot topic, but so are the celebs who write, sing, rap behind the scenes, do whatever when it comes to the music. And, you know, yeah. due to that, cancel culture is alive and well. <laughs> and there's a ton of folks who who are on the list, who may have gotten themselves off and came back. <laughs> but we just want to, let's break it down at first from our perspective as the listeners, your perspective as a person in the industry, which is what is cancel culture? And in general, just let's talk about how we feel about it. Mm. So, cancel culture to me. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, kick it off. It's like, listen, I'll kick it off. <laughs> you have someone that you you may have in your mind is this type of way, sings this kind of song, is this kind of person to you, evokes this kind of feeling in your mind. Then all of a sudden they say something or they do something that just like this kind of irks. This doesn't go along with this song that you had on track number five, album number two. <laughs> so because of that. We're, we're done. You know, you said something a little egregious. You said something a little offensive. Mm-hmm. You spoke your mind, but in a way that doesn't appease what you've been doing so far, you sound inauthentic. And we're going to show you that we still have the power. We still have the buying dollars. We're going to do that by bashing online. We're going to do that by not supporting your next project. We're going to do that by just getting our little Twitter fingers off <laughs> and, <laughs> and saying what needs to be said. How I feel about it, I feel like I kind of said <laughs> through all of that. But, no, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you. But, it, but that's 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 what it is to me. Yeah, I I agree. I think you know, entertainment in general is based upon the the support of the consumers. Yes. Um, and so you voluntarily decide who you want to support. You know what I'm saying? If you're like, oh, I like this song from Beyonce, I'm now a lifetime fan. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's you're right. Um, but if that artist you know, not Beyonce, because she like, she does everything perfectly. But, um, <laughs> like, no gap. But another artist, if they're doing something that you don't necessarily agree with, then you also have the right to not support that other artist, you know? So I think it goes, like, nobody's mad when you are supporting someone. Um, well, that's a lie. People get mad all the time about everything. But, you know, you're making that voluntary that voluntary choice of supporting an artist, so you can make that same choice of not supporting them based upon whatever your own personal ethical code could be. Yeah, do you find cancel culture? I mean, I agree with everything that you're saying, right? I agree. Yeah. I agree that cancel culture is a way to kind of filter what it is that you're seeing, watching, listening to, and being a part of, right? Right. Now, do you feel that cancel culture is a detriment to the entertainment industry as maybe artists or actors or whatever are going to be more 
hesitant to say what's on their mind or hesitant to do stuff because they're afraid of being canceled? Mm -hmm. Um, or do you find it to be a beneficial thing where it keeps them more on their toes? So they're not offending people. Mm -hmm. You know, I know uh, comedians, I think it was like Dave Chappelle. He was saying something that like, everyone's so sensitive. (laughs) You can't do anything. You're going to get canceled. Right. So like, he's obviously not a fan, but like, what do you think about cancel? Yeah. I think it's everything Everything that you said, I think, you know, um, yeah, it's a little bit everything. Everybody has their own motives regarding who they want to cancel. Some folks want to cancel an artist to punish them or cancel an actor or entertainer to punish them. Like, I want to punish them. I'm going to have a survey. Don't stream their music. Don't buy their music. Some folks just don't want to even worry about that. Like me, like if I don't, if I don't want to support an artist, I don't care about punishing them. Yeah. I, I just personally can't, like, I'll just speak for music. Like if somebody's doing music, and, you know, I find out later that they're doing a crime that's hurting women in our community, that's hurting other folks. Like, I just can't, I'm listening to it and that's reminding me of what they're doing. So for me, I'm cutting it off, not canceling them like, oh my God, but like, I can't listen to it just because I don't want it in my psyche. Whatever the vibes you were on, I don't even want those vibes with me. I don't want to, I don't want to remind myself that you kind of exist. So I don't care what, you can have 5 billion fans I'm not rocking with it. That's just me. There's some other folks, but that ain't good enough. They like, I ain't listening to it, and I don't want y'all listening to it either. <laughs> so there's that. So yeah, so everything is right. So in terms of people, people on their toes, yeah. I mean, you know, sensitive is a word. Sensitive is a weird word because sensitive is always defined by whoever is offended. You know what I'm saying? Like, if there's a situation to where somebody is talking about, like, oh, like I don't like people with brown shirts on. You know what I'm saying? And then they're saying in a room where Ashley has a brown shirt, uh, you know, um, like, or whoever has a brown shirt. And they're like, Akilah, I call her Ashley. Akilah has a brown shirt. They're going to be like, what are you, you saying, you saying, what, you're talking about me? You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I'm just saying, you know, brown shirts. You know what I'm saying? Like, whatever. So, like, that's, that's, they could be like, oh, you're just being sensitive. I'm just making a joke. And you, you could be like, well, no, nah, I'm the only person here with a brown shirt. Why are you trying to single me out? You know what I'm saying? And they, I was just joking with you because I like your shirt. So you never know people's motivations, right? So that's that's the whole point. So it really, you know, it, it's not to ramble here, but it's like, it really depends on the person. Um, I definitely think entertainers now need to be able to read the room um, because you are selling a product. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're putting out music, it's, yeah, it's a form of, of expression, but you're also still selling a project, a, a product. So you have to be mindful of the mindset of your consumers. And if your consumers aren't happy with what you're saying, they may not buy your product. And that's perfectly fine. But you have to be aware of that. If the trend is don't talk about people with brown shirts and you make a song saying F people with brown shirts and the brown shirt people create a a storm to where everybody else don't want to buy it. And you, you know, you gotta, you gotta eat that. You can't tell the brown shirt people, that they be insensitive when your consumers are some of the brown shirt people. So, you know, and I'm using that brown shirt as an overall metaphor for several things. That's a great metaphor. Tomorrow I'm going to wear orange just because right. of that. <laughs> <laughs> and if 10 years ago, if 10 years ago you had a brown shirt joke and it was cool and they bring it back up now, you may have to apologize for that brown shirt joke exactly. that came out in 2009. You know what I'm saying? Or delete all of your brown shirt jokes. So... <laughs> No, you're right, though. You're right. Read the room. In every area of life, you have to read the room. Life ain't fair. Nothing is fair. Mm -hmm. There's nothing fair, right? As Black people, we know that. Nothing is fair. That Nothing is just fair game. That doesn't exist in our world, especially when you're trying to sell a product to someone. They have the right to act however they want to act. And as the entertainer, you have to be able to navigate that. And the reason why, for the people who are listening and that aren't watching us on YouTube, the reason why this brown shirt joke is, <laughs> is because Akila and I are both wearing brown shirts today. Like, we're both to have on brown. So, this is why. <laughs> what we're saying is after this, we're going to have a petition. We want <laughs> to sign it. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, and that's, and that's the case, man. It's, it's, it's tough. It's great. And, and, you know, it kind of ties into what we were saying earlier in terms of because I'm thinking of the reason why cancel culture is so evident now, and you can name some of the names. We got Kanye on the list, R. Kelly, Corey yes. Lane recently, Terry Crews, Doja Cat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are just more recent times. <laughs> <kind of Right>. 
<laughs> Doja <laughs> knows it all. She said cozy. Can't pop back with cancer culture, but but it's fine. But it's fine. <laughs> but it's fine. Um, I think the reason goes back to what you're saying in terms of the trend of the music industry as a whole. Like it's now based more so on the person selling their own project and everything. You can't hide behind a label in the yeah. same sense that you could beforehand. You know, you can't hide at all. You got to yeah. be able to be responsible for what you say and stand in it. And if you believe what you're saying, cool. Yeah, Just know that everything has a consequence. The same energy that it takes to love somebody you know, it takes less to hate somebody. You know what I'm saying? Or sometimes equal. So you have to realize that that comes from the same place. The same people who are falling out over you and the same people who are hating on you is going to make a, a million surveys trying to ban you and petitions to ban you. That comes from the same place. It's, it's that true. same passion comes from the same source. You know it's, what I'm saying? So that that is what it is. So how do people, how would you say if you were, I know you're not manager of these artists, yeah. right? If you were to manage some of these artists, how would you say that they should or could potentially get themselves off of that cancel list? You know, <laughs> we recently saw, you know, for instance, Kanye and Nick Cannon did an amazing, I think that Cannon class, that two-part series, Ebony, shout out to you for like, you know, sending it to me and, and saying, yeah. to watch this when it first came out. I thought that was amazing, but I'm probably <laughs> biased coming from a, you know, Jesus walks all falls down like Kanye. Right. Said. Yeah, but, but. That, means, that means you're a Rob Fest fan, you know what I mean? But that's, you know, I'm joking, I'm joking. Okay, back to the question. <laughs> How can some of these folks get off? Like, what would you say now is what you need to do? Um, I mean, it depends on the list. <laughs> you know, I feel like Kanye is somebody who's like on several list for lists for several different reasons. Um. I don't know. I mean, you got to watch what you say. I mean, that could be so generic with it, but like, you know, you know, what, what was the series of events? Did you say something that nobody asked for, offended a large group of people that you want to sell a product to, you know? So it's like, you have to either undo what you did, apologize for what you did and not doing anymore, or stand firm in that and hope that you have enough consumer base left <laughs> besides the folks that you offended to continue your mission, you know? One of the things that I think celebrities in general um, sometimes forget and all of their power is that their power comes from the people. And so when you're bragging to people about the millions that you have, the billions that you have, the power that you have, the resources that you have, you know, I'm Walt Disney, I'm all these different people. You're, 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 what you're saying is that I'm an, influ an influential, influential person that has power based upon the amount of people that support me. So when you forget that and then offend and alienate the people that are supporting you, that power is going to come away. True. So in order to get off that list, you have to be mindful of what you're saying and who your audience is. And if it's the audience of people who are putting you in those positions, then you need to be careful and tread lightly. Now, if you don't want to tread lightly, you got to take whatever comes. And this may be what comes from it. So it, it is what it is. It, it's, a, it's a tricky game. Um, and you have to know what you say and mean what you say. And if you mean what you say, stand by it. If you don't, stop saying things that you don't mean and stop yeah. saying things that you don't want to say. More into what you can get, the, the pool of people that you got to appease. Is that that's awesome. it. That's, that's, that's it. And, and, and not just saying, because yeah. you name a few people in that. Stop mm -hmm. doing things that are hurting the community. Stop being a creep. Um, mm -hmm. Stop utilizing your power to um, victimize other people. Um, in these cases, it's been uh, Black women. Um, yeah, just stop being a horrible human being, expecting people to overlook you being a horrible human being because you got a couple records, you know what I'm saying? Um, or several. So, so yeah, if you are harming the community, sometimes music can't smooth that. Yeah, that's yeah. real. So, yeah, just stop being, uh, not saying and nobody's perfect, but if you're clearly doing illegal crimes that are hurting someone else, you got to kind of expect that you may get canceled. You know, it is what it is. Yeah, and, like, the reason why I sent um this interview to Akila, right so it's this Kanye and um, Nick Cannon interview yeah. that they did on Cannon's class it's on YouTube yep um I sent this to Akila when it first came out because I was like you know what like Kanye I feel like is always at the top of the list on everyone's cancel culture and at the <laughs> time of the interview he had just finished crying and I think it was like North Carolina like on yeah. his birthday party presidency stance or whatever and Anyways, I was watching it out of curiosity to try to find better understanding for Kanye because I know he's, you know, with the mental health and all of this other stuff he has going on. 
Um, maybe the pressure is getting to him. I don't know. So I just wanted to have better understanding for him. So I watched it. And at mm -hmm. first I have to say, I was really confused. And I'm, <laughs> I was confused because it was hard to follow the conversation. This man talks on a level that is like, and Nick Cannon seemed to be right there with him. Like he seemed to understand what was happening. And the yeah. whole time, I'm like, like the first 10 minutes of the interview, I was like, I'm so lost. Like, is anyone else so, like, I'm so lost <laughs> on what's being said right now? Um, but you don't understand him, it don't mean that he's nice. Shout out to Jay. Shout out to Jay Z, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't understand him, but don't mean that he's nice because we're at Kofi. Don't come on, y'all. Yeah. Preach. Preach. <laughs> Blueprint two bars. Walter's over here gonna give us a whole verse. <laughs> <laughs> the verse makes sense. Jay Z the prophet. You feel me? Apply that to many different situations. But continue. Sorry. We will. Um, but you know, Kanye said a lot in the interview. He was talking, but you know what? At, eventually, he came around. In my opinion, I think he came around in the interview to where he was making some sense. Like he was talking about just like black culture, and um, he seemed to have this. Uh, I don't know. He says crazy stuff in the media. And so it almost like contradicts him, but I feel like he goes back and forth. So I feel like he's a character in the media that kind of like flip flops, right? Mm -hmm. So like on TMZ, he's saying like, we asked for slavery, but then in like this interview, now he's <laughs> kind of standing up for the black community a little bit. Did you kind of get that vibe or how are you feeling when you watch this interview? Yeah, I, it's just, it's a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even know. <laughs> ask for you, okay, let me, let's <laughs> Let me narrow this question because it sure. is a lot. So do you think Kanye is a misunderstood character in the media? Um, or do you think he kind of gets what he puts out there? I feel like it's more of the latter. Uh, mm -hmm. Because in order to be misunderstood, I mean, he's saying the same things, you know? He's saying the same things 10 different ways, but he's saying the same thing. You know, I think he truly believes what he's saying. Um, I think that he wants others to believe what he's saying because um, he keeps saying it, you know? I think one of the things that we got to do, and I, you know, and I'm saying this because I've had my heartbreaks with artists that I love, that I support, that have done things that I think they wouldn't be able to do. You know, they've let me down. We have to be in a situation to where we can move on, you know? I think everybody, we don't sometimes need to hear 30,000 interviews of somebody telling us what they really feel about us. You know what I'm saying? I, I remember, you know, watching entertainers, um, a lot of them, you know, talk to our current president and tell them that, you know, they made them feel like a man again, or, um, you know, you're like my father and, um, you know, I wouldn't have voted, but if I voted, I would have voted for you. Um, and this is somebody who's been detrimental to the black community. And so to have other black entertainers say this consistently um, several years in a time right now where we're, we're so detrimental to our community, um, I think they're telling you exactly what they want to say. So I don't know if he's misunderstood. I think we're trying to understand it and see the core value of the person that we fell in love with. But I think they're telling, they're, he, they're telling us what they are. And we have to be able to receive that and decide if we're going to move on from that artist or not and, and know that it's okay and know that um, there's other artists that are making great music, um, that old music is fine. Um, but if his agenda now is to use his power that we've given him to be uh, self-servant, um, self-absorbed, um, totally saying things that, again, are detrimental to the Black community. And um, I think we have to be able to move on from it. So I don't think he's misunderstood. I think we're understanding exactly what he's saying. Okay, yeah, because I mean, he's you know, saying everything, he's saying everything else about himself that is damaging to all of us. Yeah, all of us on this, all of us that have supported him, his core core. Uh, and I, so I, I truly understand that. Um, the other things, like, oh, one more thing I want to say too, not to be too long winded. Sometimes what artists like to do is a trick, right? The trick is uh, saying something like, hey, for, I'll use an example. Let's say I go to Ralph's, right? Everybody that's listening to this or watching this at home, Ralph is a popular store, grocery store in LA, right? Let's say I go to Ralph's, right? And um, I'm trying to 
uh, steal a box of cereal. And somebody at Ralph's catches me stealing a box of cereal, right? And I'm like, I should be able to steal a box of cereal. I've bought eight, nine boxes of cereal all the time. I left my card. I'll take it. I'll pay for it when I come back. They're like, no, you just can't steal. Okay, do you know who I am? Like, I've, I've been purchasing boxes of cereal here every day. You feel me? I, I, you know, I have, I'm in this community because of what I do. I live in this nice area because of who I am. Are you kidding me? You're not going to let me do this? I tell you what, to show you my power, I'm going to make sure that everybody who knows who I am does not shop at this grocery store, right? So I'm going to go on platforms and say, you know what? We can't go to Ralph's no more. You know what I'm saying? Because Ralph's is tripping. You know what I'm saying? Ralph's tried to stop me from buying, from taking a box of cereal. I buy a box of cereal all the time. They, they only have cereal because I'm buying it. I am the Walt Disney of buying cereal, okay? So I'm going to release all the receipts I bought of cereal. I'm going <laughs> to release the name of the person, uh, Jonathan Taylor, yeah. who registered yeah. number nine, who tried to stop me. And I want all my Black people, because I'm a Black man, so it probably was racial. I want all my Black people to not shop at Ralph's and not buy a box of cereal. We go in somewhere. We go into Walmart, okay? We go into Walmart. Right. And that's what happens. And that's, that is a funny example of what happens in the entertainment industry you all the time. Somebody will take something that's a personal driven agenda, yeah. try to build a following of other people by tying into racial injustice to use that as something that is self-servant to that person. So it ain't even about the people of what they want. It's about my ego and me yeah. utilizing and leveraging the plight of people who have nothing, no cares about it, don't even know who Ralph is, doesn't even know who Jonathan Taylor is for my own ego and my own agenda. And I'm going to bend it at will because I am an important person. That is what we're seeing. And so then the conversation becomes about the people boycotting the situation and not about him trying to steal a box of cereal because he felt entitled. Because mm -hmm. I felt entitled. That's what this is about. And that's what people don't see. And then, and then most of social media, they catch on to the protest against Ralph. They're not even, they don't even realize the whole stealing the box scenario. They're not even questioning the source. And it's not true, because I know we kind of led into that from the Kanye Nick Cannon interview, yes. but that's not that's not Kanye specific. It's it's a lot of these artists these days, a lot of folks in the industry these days, not even only artists, sometimes even the folks who may get caught as the manager, may get caught as the 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 owner, you know. So sometimes it's not it's not the artists themselves. Um, but do you know how many artists like let, let's keep it, let's keep it a thousand. Yeah. A thousand. Keep it a thousand. You, listen. There's a lot of, like I said earlier in this, this interview or uh, this conversation, there are people in the entertainment industry that don't have our best interests at heart. And that's one of the first things that I mentioned, right? So this is excusing the evil politics sometimes that are in the entertainment industry in general, music, fashion, TV, whatever. There's evil politics everywhere. There's a law firm at a school. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? At the same time, you know, there's other cases, scenarios where the entertainers, artists themselves are the problem. And they have the loudest microphone. So, and you, we love them, right? We don't love the senior A and R at such and such records. We love Taylor Swift, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> or whoever. So, if, so if somebody else is like, oh man, let's let's say right, let's for example, let's say an artist reads a contract, misunderstands something that they signed, um, then goes to the radio, bashes the record label, I'm a slave, let me go. They got it. It goes public, right? The manager calls him after the interview. Hey, I read that. Actually, actually, that's not your. That's not what it says. It says that you actually own ninety five percent, and it's all good. And the artist's like, okay, cool. That's great. I feel great. I feel great now. I feel like that didn't happen. Great. That artist right. is not going to go back on the radio and say that was the case. The artist is not going to go back and say that when you know I was broke, this person bought me an apartment that I didn't pay for yet. They're not gonna say I still owe money because my album didn't sell because I put out these bad records that didn't perform. I'm not gonna say that I'm living off of the money that I haven't earned back yet. I'm not gonna say that this other person took a chance on me when I didn't have anything and you would even know who I am if you didn't sign me. They're not gonna say that. Yes. They're going to tell you their, um, their version of it and then the people that are being harmed don't have a platform to say it because we don't care about them. We care mm -hmm. about the artists. And that happens very, very frequently. Yes. I know artists that have like the labels to pay for their child support. I've had people pay for just the, the things that they don't even are not even contractually required to do. 
And that never gets mentioned, right? There was even a, the story about the Rough Riders documentary where like Jay-Z had like, uh, like bought out DMX's contract or something. Like DMX was in heavy debt and like Jay-Z was able to release him. He didn't owe anything, right? You would never hear a story like that. But if Jay-Z owed him $5, <laughs> not even DMX, somebody else would have said it. Somebody else would have been like, you see, Jay-Z owes him $5 from 1997. You know what I'm saying? And that's what happened. So that 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 goes back to what I'm saying. It's all about perception. It's all about agendas. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes things aren't as transparent as they are. Sometimes things have hidden meanings. And now the audience are pawns of this plan. Um, so you don't, so basically go back to, to the Ebony's question. You don't know what to believe. Right. How do you fact check something? You, you you know I love eight of your songs. I'm rocking with you, yeah. right? Yeah. But the person you may be rocking with may not be being honest with you and not being transparent and are using you as leverage to get a better deal, yeah, or to use that deal to then do the same thing that they're saying to their artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they can live in that nice house and then stun on you later about how they're way more successful than you how they balling out with five, six cars and how you need to be broken, pay $800 for my concert and then buy and then pay $1,500 for my shoes and then still support me and not cancel me. So we really have to look at the whole thing here about what we're doing. Come on, that's what I, I, love I love this. I love this take on it because you see what usually happens when folks talk about cancel culture, they literally stick to the artist and the issue that was presented in public. No, let's, let's go a few layers deep Mad layers. Country in our own ways, and so we can we can see a lot of a lot of different circles. And so I love how you made sure it's shown that it's not as transparent. It's it's, it's not what they seem, and it's not that it's not that cut and dry. And I mean that's a great way to to close it out. I feel like yeah. what else to say? That's, <laughs> that's the hardest part for me too. Is me knowing this, me knowing the tea sometimes, and just reading stuff and not commenting. I'm like, yep. that didn't happen. That's not it. That's not it. I just talked to the artist. That didn't happen. I can't even say it. I can't. I'm like, it's it's all part of a show. It's all entertainment. It is, it's all entertainment. And you could say, and we're just going to, like Kanye mentioned in, in his thing, they're not controlling my mind, so they're worried about my actions. We can take it one way or the other, how we want to perceive it. But I think that's a quote that's, it, it's pretty relevant depending on how you want to view it. And right. know, we'll, we'll, we'll let it rock. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I want to make sure we jump into is the game that I talked about earlier. Good. Something that's taken the music world, really pop culture by storm, is the versus battles that Swiss Beats, Timbaland put together amazing, amazing things. We see where, where it's being distributed now and it's just, you know, I'm sure it's gonna keep going. It's gonna keep going, it's gonna keep getting better. And so what better game to play when we're talking about music, we're talking about people, we're talking about icons in their own way. Is so let's come up with some hypothetical situations. Do we'll it. read out, you know, two artists and you'll tell me just quick fire who you think will win that battle. So we'll say an example. For instance, we mentioned Missy Elliott. They, they would never be in the room together necessarily. <laughs> Missy, Missy Elliott and Pharrell. You mentioned those two people. I say Missy Elliott versus Pharrell. You say, oh, I got my money on Pharrell. Oh, I got my money on Missy. Whatever it might be. Feel yeah. free to share why. And if not, we'll just leave it as a thing. And I want... Uh, that's hard. And I mentioned that too. I literally said that in my interview with Teddy Riley. I literally said that. Um, that was my suggestion. That's tough. That's so, that like pulls in my heartstrings. Um, <laughs> because I said Missy and Pharrell because so many reasons, like obviously they're best friends, um, but same era, um, songwriting for everyone, um, features, remixes, hooks, singing and rapping their own solo stuff. Missy with Timbaland, Pharrell in the Neptunes, um, you know, Missy being her artist, him being in the RD. Um, they just the remixes, the, the collaborations. It's 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 like a it's like a mirror match. Yeah. In terms of who would win, it's really tough. Um, I would say, if I had to just edge like a hair, like <laughs> a hair, a hair edge. Uh, I mean, I would lean towards probably Pharrell only because. There's just probably more music. Yeah, it's probably yeah. a hair of more music, and um, although Missy produced a lot of things and wrote a lot of things, the Neptunes have probably produced maybe a tad bit more songs together, um, mm -hmm. especially in the last, you know, in terms of the run, the run. So it would be a hair. It would be a hair. But ask me tomorrow, I'm probably gonna say I'm tripping. It, it, it should be Missy. So, but a, a hair, a hair. 
and, and those, that, those are the best conversations when you can't really you yeah get that on either side it's but a head into something they go road and oh man forget what i said i don't know i don't even know i don't know <laughs> Well, no worries. It's, it's tough. It's tough. No worries because those are not even the artists that are on your list. So don't. Okay. Okay. Worry. Okay. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's oh, get it. The example. That's when you know it's real. <laughs> that was hard. That was hard. Like, give me somebody else. Not not Virginia. I got you. <laughs> go ahead, Adam. We'll we'll go back and forth with with who. Okay. Okay. So the first matchup is Sierra versus Kelly Rowland. Who you got your money on? Um, that's a good one too. Um, is, is is Kelly playing Destiny Child songs? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Coffee on repeat and motivation on repeat. She gotta do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're talking about volume of songs, Sierra has more solo song, like more solo songs, because she's she's never been in a group. So uh, that's kind of unfair, man. That's kind of like a a handicap match. She's literally she's playing a solo artist her whole time. This like Kelly's been mostly Destiny's Child, so like that's not a fair. Okay, man. fine. She can play <laughs> Destiny's Child. <laughs> oh, this, 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 this Kelly. <laughs> I love both of them, but yeah, if you play a Destiny's Child song, like that, what the highest selling group of all time? Like them and TLC. Like what's up? Come on, man. What about Summer Walker versus Janae Iko? Mmm. That's another one too, where Janae has more songs. Um, I don't know. That's tough. That's really tough. Um, I probably play Summer Walker a little bit more, so personally, but I don't know. I mean, if you're talking about, I mean, ten songs, twenty songs, and, and this is stuff that they've written and produced. This is something that they've written, right? Wrote for other people because right. Janae, because Janae is written for a lot of people too. Oh, she, may, she, she may have written for more people than than Summer. So I don't know. That's a tough one. That's a that's a tough one. It's, it's just so over songs. Pick one, Walker. Which one? Songs. Everybody's like, she's going, everybody's like, you gonna pick one. Um, personal, I would pick Summer. I was about to say, it sounded like Summer. <laughs> I would personally pick Summer. I think people would picture that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> next, your next matchup. I, this one's gonna be hard, so I'm gonna need you to listen when I tell you, because I'm gonna need you to think on it, okay? Okay. Come, come back with the response now. Okay. Ready? Okay. okay. Kendrick Lamar uh -huh. versus Kendrick. J. Cole. <laughs> <laughs> Kendrick Lamar. I mean, that's not a hard one. No, I like J. Cole. I like J. Cole. I like J. Cole. I like J. Cole. I like Jermaine. Shout out to all my people at St. John. You know what I mean? I like all of it. That's like North Carolina, all that. Dream over stuff. Yeah. I'm, Kendrick's in my top five of all time. Okay. He's okay. Like number five of all time rappers to me. Yes, yes. You're gonna, you gonna. It would have to be like Kendrick versus Jay Z or something, or Kendrick versus Nas for me to be like, oh my god, you know what I mean? Okay. okay. okay speaking of, speaking of some classic, this is a hard. <laughs> we're we're just throwing it at you just to be just to be <laughs> <laughs> talk about notorious Big versus Tupac. Let's let's officially. Oh, Biggie, Biggie. Yeah, yeah, Biggie, yeah. Biggie, Biggie Frank, Frank Wright, Wright. You know, notorious Christopher Wallace. Whoever you want to <laughs> say. Biggie, yeah, for for me, yeah, I love I love Tupac, but Biggie is probably my number one number one rapper of all time that I've listened to ever. Nice, okay. Yeah. Next matchup, we're gonna throw it back as well. Let's. It's easy. It's easy with the, with the guys. It's so it's, it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> the guys, it's like oh, I can pick, I can pick somebody. What's up? <laughs> Next matchup is Public Enemy versus N.W.A. Mm, that's a good one. Uh, NWA. Okay. NWA. Yeah. Are you saying it because of their public appeal versus Public Enemy? I know. <laughs> the no, name. I like actually. I think Public Enemies is probably the more conscious driven, like like probably like closer to my vibe because right. I'm not like a gangster from you know, pop You know what I mean? But it's but it, but in terms of music, like you know, for me, music excites me when it teaches me something that I I don't really know outside of my. Coat. That's why I love uh, Kendrick Lamar. J. Cole inherently is probably more like me, but me hearing Kendrick Lamar's stories is more entertaining to me, it's more educational to me. So NWA is the same thing. NWA is like, I would have had no idea how things were going on in California and, and what they were going through without NWA. So to me, I probably listen more to them off of educational. So yeah, I got more NWA in my Serato. You know what I mean? I love it. I yeah. Love it. But I love Public Enemy. Chuck D, I mean, he's a master, man. You know what I mean? Like he's a, a legend. So. Yeah. Can't lose. Can't lose. 
what about take it back to the ladies? And I'm now only saying it, I might have to switch it up for you, but I'll say it anyway. Lauren Hill <laughs> versus Foxy Brown. Jeez, that's a that's an off-putting matchup. So, all right. That's what I was like. I may have to switch this up for you, but let's see how what you think about the original. Look, everybody's gonna say Lauren Hill. I have more Foxy Brown songs on my phone. Mm-hmm. Mainly because Foxy Brown has more rap records that I like. I think Lauren Hill is one of the most skilled MCs ever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but but yeah, in terms of that, it's tough. The people would say Lauren Hill because Lauren Hill's had a bigger impact culturally. But musically, like Foxy has one of the most unique uh, yeah. female rap voices ever, like so ever, I, if ever. Gonna, if we put Foxy instead against Lil Kim, would you? Yes. Say- oh, I was just gonna say that. I was then just I, then gonna I, then, say that. Then, that to me, that to me is what the people want to see. That to, that to me is like, if we want to beat Brady and Monica, put Little Kim and Foxy Brown. Um, you need it. You I would, I would, I would. That would be, ish versus the ill nana. We gotta. That, that would be tougher. I would probably edge the Little Kim because again, I go off of really. When you ask me these questions, I'm thinking about. Okay, I don't want to cap. How many of these people's songs do I have in my phone? True. True. I have more Little Kim songs in my phone than Foxy Brown. Yeah. Interesting. And LaBella Mafia, I mean, people talk about hardcore, but LaBella Mafia is damn near a classic to me. Yeah, classics, classics. Yeah, nice. yeah, Lil' Kim, Lil' Kim is like, everybody got this off from Lil' Kim. Lil' Kim is the prototype. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I, awesome. right, I loved it. That was so good. That was so good. I really want to get into Live the Biz, okay? I want to know hey. all about the music, mind, and motivation that you do. And so let's get into it. So what made you start okay. Music, Mind, and Motivation? Sure. Um, yeah, it was really off that week, you know, when George Floyd, uh, you know, w- was murdered. Um, and, and so that week, well, to back it up, sort of people out there, Live the Biz, I found it in 2017 uh, as a platform to uh, educate those who want to be in the music industry. So we use a lot of panels. So I started in New York, ended up doing, you know, these sold out panels in New York, LA, Philly, Nashville, and Atlanta, um, showcasing minority voices, primarily Black, Black voices in the entertainment industry educating people who want to learn more about it from a creative aspect, from a business aspect. So we have speakers from major brands all across the world, record labels, television networks, et cetera. So um, my last event was the Grammy event we did this year called Women of Color uh, Who Live the Biz, where I showcase seven black women in different various roles of the music industry. Uh, and so my next event was gonna be for BT and you know, COVID-19. <laughs> so I, I was so um, in that I was like, I want to do something virtually, but I'm not sure yet, you know? Um, and I didn't want to jump to do like the Zoom panel, stuff like that. Cause although I thought they were cool, what I was seeing, I, I wanted to make sure that I was reading the room. Um, and I didn't want to jump to telling people, hey, if you want to be this vice president, be like that, be like that. While people are losing jobs, people are being sick, people are going through all this stuff, you know what I'm saying? This was like March, April, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and so then when the George Floyd situation happened, when he was murdered, um, it was just so much anger and hurt uh, for my community um, and wanted to pour that energy in something positive. So I said, I'll tell you what, I don't want to do like a Zoom thing where it's like a one-off, seven people talking to you about how great they are. Let me do something to where I can help um, uplift and elevate uh, Black voices to educate people in this time, to give them something else different to look at than us you know, being killed. Uh, and so I thought about doing a series. I thought about doing a series of like just 14 voices that I really respect around the country. Um, some folks that I would have had on that panel for BT and some folks that I want to t- t- tap back in with. So I thought of like 14 folks that I thought would be great um, in various parts of the business. So entertainment law, music publishing, record label, um, branding and marketing, podcasts, um, you know, music production, um, independent artists. I want to cover, I want to almost have like a visual audio book. Like if you looked at all the interviews from one to 14, um, you would get the spectrum as far as what you should know about the music industry. So I used that week. So in, in a week and a half, I did 14 interviews. I did 14 interviews. I, um, I, I, de- I decided how I want to do it because I saw IG Lives and I thought I like IG Lives from the interactive perspective, the engagement perspective, but it's hard to brand. So I thought, um, why don't I just do like Zooms where then I could do all these together. I could brand them, put graphics on it. And that way I could set a certain time a week I can, I can drip them out. Cause if I try to do these lives every week, my career is like crazy. <laughs> so I wouldn't have time to be consistent. Um, so I literally did all these interviews in a week and a half, like some three a day, some four a day. 
uh, and I was editing them in real time. So I was editing everything and the graphics and the trailers and the flyers. Um, I did all those things. Which is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I mean, people don't understand. People are like, oh my God, who's your, who's your graphic person? I'm like, me. Like, <laughs> The, the recaps, yeah. formatting it for IGTV, then doing the recaps and formatting that for IG timeline, then formatting for a story, then putting music in it, then having the, the graphics, the topics changing, the words changing, the, the, the introductions, the transitions. You'll watch an interview and then the first 15 seconds is about an important piece and then the intro will come and then the full interviews. Like I literally did all of that. So it took me about a week and a half to do the interviews and another week just for editing. Um, and then after I did that, and I looked back at it, then I made the announcement, dropped the, the mega trailer on IG. And then every week um, from June till up until uh, last week, I had an interview. The only interview that I did outside of that 14 was Teddy Riley's. Um, he, he had seen the, the series and I even did that like a month ago um, and decided that that would be the season, fina the season finale um, of it. Uh, you know what's funny? Let me show you just how working in your passion works. First episode that I dropped was with Jay Nova, um, who was um, a very viral, independent R&B artist. Um, she actually went viral doing a, a impersonation of Beyonce. Um, she kills it. Like she, her, she sounds exactly like Beyonce. She's amazing. Um, and in that interview, we were talking about the intersectionality of hip hop and R&B. And I asked her, I was like, you know, what do you think about people saying there's too much hip hop and R&B? And she was like, I don't understand it. Cause like in the 90s they had it. I was like, yeah, back in the 90s you had New Jack Swing. You had people like Teddy Riley, producing New Jack Swing that was essentially merging hip hop and R&B. That was the first episode. Had no idea that my last episode of the season would be with Teddy Riley and me asking him when he created New Jack Swing, did he face backlash from the older generation of his era because he was merging that. That's, and that's just, and, and that wasn't even planned. So from the first, from first, from first to May, who would have known that, you know what I'm saying? So that's what I mean about operating your purpose it's going to connect it's going to bridge you can't plan for stuff like that um and so yeah that's that's how it kicked off i love it yes and how did i mean you kind of answered the question but i want to make sure people know like did you mm -hmm. anticipate this level of buzz like you know oh no nah. <laughs> if, if folks who don't know i mean it's a great series so if you don't know it's still on his ig look the best you can check it out but it's like Moving. thousands upon thousands of views and you know all of this kind of stuff a lot of engagement and it's because yeah content but did you anticipate this level of buzz and how do you intend now to keep it up because now there's officially going to be a season two yeah i'm not you know what i'm saying <laughs> i'm not. You know, i would keep it up i would keep it so what what thousand with you i really did this because i wanted to pour back into it you know what i'm saying my always think i've always been about like events based right um i was like i don't want to put too much content so i want to come to events so i put too much content <laughs> um so it was really just operating from a pure space it could have been a thousand views it could have been a hundred it could have been five like it was it was healing for me um it was something I went to that was positive it was something that I thought we could repurpose for something else um so to expect it to be thousands of views um you know you can't plan for that I wanted to look I want to look high level I want I definitely want to look smooth I want to look great I want to be consistent with my brand um I didn't anticipate but I didn't anticipate was the amount of shares so for those who have seen those views that's coming from people sharing it so much. Like I'm getting like 500, 600 shares on an interview on average and people are seeing it. People not even like, oh, they may not even follow me, but they're going to watch the, watch the interview. So I didn't anticipate that. Um, for me, when I did the series, this is my mind. I think I talked about this with you. Okay, I was like, okay, this is like back in May. So like, okay, let me put the series out now. Because you know, back in September, October, we're going to be out in the streets. You feel me? I'm going to do an end of the year event. We're going to talk about it. We're going to rap. You know, it's going to be like October, November. We're going to be back out here in these, you know, these big event spaces. It's lit. This is just a little interim period. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I didn't realize that, like, at the end of the series, we would still be uncertain of it. You know, I started this with the whole George Floyd thing. I'm ending it the day that they're announcing they're not going to do anything about Breonna Taylor's killers. So that was a little bit, you know, disheartening, to say the least. So yeah, so to keep it up in terms of that, like I definitely want to do a season two. Um, I've decided to win. It'll definitely be next year. Um, there's a lot of entertainers that reached out to me to be on season two. What I don't want it to be is a thing where I'm just interviewing celebrities. That's not the purpose of what it's, it's about. Um, I don't want to be like, like in the Breakfast Club. Like I love the Breakfast Club, but that's not what this platform is for. So it's going to be figuring out what the next 14, 15 people are going to be. 
um, yeah, so I don't have any expectations. I just want to put out the best quality of work and whatever comes from that comes from that. Love it. Love it. That's, 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 that's the only, that's the only goal. People should take more often. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not monetizing it. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I'm blessed to be able to like, I make source money from my, my career. Um, this is really all about the people, um, the people just literally to watch it, get gems and then apply it so they can monetize their industries and their passion and their, their love. Uh, for music so that's what it's about that's it so if it, again if it gets thirty thousand views if it gets three thousand i'm just trying to put out the best work quality i'm trying to be consistent and i want to look uh, great for the brand yeah love that's it. it that's literally no cap 100 percent. it is what it is so i guess just to, to, to wrap that up then like what for those who potentially want to do the same whether it be in the music business whether it be everything you do with live the biz whether it be what you're doing now with music find motivation like just general advice that you would have for them um, because I love how you're tapping into multiple aspects of music. Yeah. And there are things people want to do, probably probably a sliver of that. Probably yeah. the pie. Like just tell people what what advice do you have for folks. Um, you know, be intentional. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier about having like a five year plan. I have like I have like year plan, three year, five year plan. Um, it's great to change plans, it's great to add things to it. But I think if you're operating from a standpoint of like this is where I want to go, you'll figure it out. Um, I tell people like that all the time, like my, even my mentees, think about your career like Google Maps, right? Like think about trying to go to a destination that you've never been before, right? Like we're in LA, let's say you were trying to go to Malibu for the first time, you put, you know, you put Malibu in the Google map, right? So the Google map's gonna tell you, okay, these are the four or five directionals you have to do, make a left here, right here, left here. Let's say you make a left and there's like an accident on the street, right? You have to pivot, right? And so as you pivot, the Google map's gonna change to get you back in a certain course. Um, or let's say, oh, I see Krispy Kremes. I want to stop by Krispy Kremes, right? So then you stop there and it's going to change. So you get some Krispy Kreme and you're going to go back on the road. That's essentially what I mean. It's like, like you have a destination and there may be certain turns that you have to take in that, but you know where you're going and you know you're going because you put that in the map. You know that wherever it is, I'm going to go in the middle of that. I'm going to end up at Malibu. Yeah. It comes in. Uh, whatever. And and that's what I think people should really do with their careers. Not like going to be in Malibu, but like, you know, when you do a plan, plot out where you want to go with it. And it may take certain strategies or different routes of getting there. You know, the strategy that my homie took to get to Malibu may not be my strategy. When he went, when he drove to, the, to Malibu, it may not have been an accident. He may not like Krispy Kremes. You know what I'm saying? He may not have seen it. You know what I'm saying? Maybe I saw it. You know, maybe I needed more gas. I stopped at the gas. Maybe whatever it was, you know what I'm saying? I had to make, make a call, so I stopped at the end of the road. Like, it doesn't matter. If we both get to Malibu, that's all that matters. You know what I'm saying? He may have got to Malibu in 30 minutes, which is almost impossible, but it happens. Mm -hmm. I may have got to Malibu in two hours. You know what I'm saying? By the end of the day, that's what matters. And so not worrying about how fast he got to Malibu. Not worrying about, you know, him not worrying about that I stopped for Krispy Kreme. You know what I'm saying? It's more a situation of like, we had a destination, we had a goal, and we got there. And that's my that's my best advice for people. It's like map out where you want to go. Um, don't don't uh, leverage no, no, not leverage. Don't try to mirror what you've seen somebody else do just because you think it's gonna work for you. What works for you may be just for you, and there's nothing wrong with that. Because then what works for you, somebody else is gonna see that. Um, so be intentional. Um, be as fearless as you can, um, especially in entertainment. There will be a lot of people that will challenge you. Uh, challenge your expertise based on what you look like, what you sound like. Sometimes people aren't confident in you. Sometimes people are threatened by you. Um, not really caring about either <laughs> is the best way of dealing with that. Um, because essentially it's, it's your path. Um, and the people that are in these positions may not be in those positions when yeah. you get to where you're going. And sometimes they may need you. I've had quite a few full circle moments where people who wouldn't even answer an email from me are willing to fly across the country just to have five minutes of coffee with me. And this is like, no stunt. This is what it is. People who, and I still take those meetings because essentially my goal is still the same. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would say, you know, have that map for your life, be intentional, be consistent, um, try to stand on something, knowing who you are um, and really writing things down, writing things down and understanding that it's okay. If it takes you longer to get to Malibu to somebody else. I mean, it's, and it's, and it's, and it's okay. It's totally okay. As long as you get there or get to somewhere better than Malibu. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But, but as long as you have that goal and that purpose um, set for yourself, you're able to align your goals that you're going in a direction that you want and that, you know, five years later, you can be proud of, of where you're at um, and keep going. And if not, then keep going. Keep going even harder. That is a word. And 
thank you. Thank you for that. Because I feel like there's a ton of people, even us listening, like, you know, you need, people need that kind of encouragement. People need yeah. that kind of direction, especially in these days and times. Like if you didn't believe in the idea that things would pivot and you would have to pivot, you got to believe it now. <laughs> you got to you got to to. Never would have thought, never would have thought this, this COVID thing would happen. <laughs> like <laughs> never, like the things that have happened this year, good and bad. I'm just like, never, ever. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's, it's crazy. It's literally crazy out of like a poor sci-fi movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Seriously. What's your very entertaining movies, by the way? Sometimes they're the best movies. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> Sharknado is, is a classic. And it worked out. <laughs> That's that's a metaphor for life. But but they say Sweet Sweet was boring. That's a fact. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Walter, for joining us today. This was uh, empowering. I don't even know all the words. It was empowering. It's insightful. It was deep. It was funny. It was an amazing, amazing conversation. As we knew it would be. We had Walter unlocked for a while. We're like, we're not ready to give y'all this in episode one, episode two. <laughs> y'all, y'all, y'all gonna have to build up to Walter. So our loyalists will get it <laughs> and will understand. And we're yeah. ready for you folks who would who would hear you and hear this message that you had to say. Like, you know, so if there's anything else that we probably didn't ask you that you want to share, feel free to do this now. Is well, shout out to the loyalist. I like that term, loyalist. Yes. <laughs> that is fire. Like, like to call people that support you loyalist is fire. That last, not like to try to hype it up, but that's that's such a heavy layered thing. Um, yeah, I love that. I really like that a lot. Yeah. Um, no, not really. I mean, uh, people just really stay encouraged. You know what I'm saying? Um, this is a really tricky time right now um, to, to just balance everything. I would definitely keep saying that people really take care of like your self-care and your, your mental health. Um, mental health has this stigma of like, oh, I'm crazy. I need like five therapists. It's not necessarily that. It's more just about like doing things that are going to get you through the day. Um, get you through the week. You know, right now we're being removed from family. We're being removed from um, normal normalcy and stuff like that. Normalcy, however you say it. When we remove those things, so I think right now you're taking care of yourself and um, and knowing that you can't be all things to all people. Uh, knowing that if somebody doesn't give you a call back or somebody's not texting you regularly, like people are going through real stuff right now and don't take it personally because I think those things affect mental health too. Like when you're a person that's always like the carer and not being able, able to care or judging how people care for you could be a bit of a mind freak. But we're in a time where people didn't expect. So people are acting in ways they didn't expect. Um, so that's taking it personally and not beating yourself over you not being able to reach out to people. You know, I think it's really about just having that extra level of empathy for what's going on right now. Um, because again, professionally, we always we're so driven, right? So it's always like, oh, as long as my career is great, I'm great. Sometimes that's the last thing. Sometimes the career is perfectly fine. It's everything else, the uncertainty of the world, you know, your relationships family with people that you love being passed away um you know being in the house cooped up dealing with vices that you may have not realized that you've had because you're in an isolated space not having that interactive interactive experience with people so my last thing is really just take care of yourself um don't beat yourself up um you know um you know if you can't network right now to build your career um you know study research prepare for when it's going to be post-covid um and then yeah that's what i would say just really just take care of yourself because we're going to get through it um and you want to be here for after that um oh and make sure that you're registered to vote for a fact um yeah and do that um that's also part of self-care and mental (laughs) 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 definitely you know and mental health for people who are in the white house you know what i'm saying (laughs) who are crazy so (laughs) i would i would say all those things say take care of everything and make sure your mental is is great Totally. Gonna, need, gonna need it. So. Where can they find you on social media? Just yeah, I'll let me. I'm out. I'm, I'm out. I'm out in these uh, IG streets. So, uh, yeah, instagramcom slash live the biz l i b e t h e b i z. You'll see all the episodes that that um, we were talking about earlier. Yeah, just enjoy. It. You know, you can just go to the, hit the little IGTV button and you can just watch all of them and just you know you know can look at it like a, a little visual book. It give like a visual series of just um, different various roles and, and avenues of, of the music industry. Totally. And it's, it's, it's laid out perfectly. Again, that's a little bit biz, so definitely do that. What about you, Ebony? Where can folks find you? Yes, you can find me on Instagram at ebonychapman12. And Akila, where we find you, girl? Where we find you? You can find me. Hopefully, you already found me. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a loyalist, you I'm are. A loyalist. <laughs> right, it, you know where I'm at. It's at Akila Friends, and that's friends with two Fs, whatever, silent. 
But you know, it's not silent what we do at the Black Creators Club. So follow us at the Black Creators Club as well. Um, we're so excited for this. And you know, just hope you enjoy today. We've got more coming for you. So until then. Congrats time. to y'all and congrats. Yeah. Sorry, I know you're signing out, but congrats to y'all. Support these two black women, man, um, that are really bringing y'all some some really dope, deep stuff um, that's fun, that's light, but also things that you should care about. Um, and they own their platform and they created themselves. So a big kudos to y'all for, for doing this and having me on the program. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Yay!